Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us uh, for the seventh event of Meet the Founders this year. Um, today, we're really excited to have Mr. Ashish Dhawan and Mr. Sanjeev Vikchandani, um, and they're going to be interviewed by Sanat and Guru. Um, why don't we just get started? So we have a small video to begin with, and then we'll, we'll start with the interview. I think it's time we blow this thing, get everybody in the stuff together. Okay, three, two, one, it's jam. Leadership. Inception. You're very approachable. Vision. Party. God-like. Lit. Effective communicators. Enthusiastic. Inspirational. At the beginning. And solo sitar. Ashoka Trivedi, Puneet Dalmia, Ashish Gupta, Drew Bagarwal, Dilip Sapti, Sanjeev Bhikchandra, Vikram Gandhi. <laughs> Can I say Gil Harris? All right, uh, thank you Abhinav and the team for the video. Um, now sir, we have heard great things about you uh, all the way from our journey in choosing to join Ashoka in the founding batch to everyone else who's come here and uh, studied here. We've seen you as inspirational figures. And uh, there's many ways that we've uh, been introduced to you through, through peers, through professors, through Wikipedia. Uh, but it'll be most interesting for us to uh, get an introduction of the other person from you, sir, and uh, if you would introduce Mr. Bikchandani. So, uh, Sanjeev is a, as a pioneer in the internet space, as you all know. Uh, but I think before that, I think it's important to know that uh, he was a risk taker from the beginning. You know, he's one of these guys who got into IIT and actually chucked it up and decided to go to Stephens, which at that time was, uh, you know, who the hell is going to go to a quote-unquote liberal arts program versus going to become an engineer at IIT. Uh, and so that risk-taking streak was always there. I think even when he started his own company, a lot of you don't realize it. These days, everybody's looking to raise money right at the outset and stuff. Sanjeev has been through, you know, period of time when Revenue uptick just wasn't there. It was, there was no capital available. And he saw his company through. This is like pre-internet in India and really pioneered uh, this business model. He's just one of the most sensible guys out there. You know, there's all this craziness happening in the business internet world. Sanjeev started this thing called Nokri. It's the dominant platform in India. EBITDA margin of 69%. It's the most profitable internet business in India. Everybody knows, else knows how to lose money. Sanjeev knows how to make money. Uh, and then I'd say Sanjeev just has a very big heart. You know, anything that you take to Sanjeev, uh, which seems like a good idea that, uh, I mean, he has very few personal needs uh, from what I can tell and what I know of him. So given that he has such few personal needs, uh, he's always willing to give very generously to lots of different causes and has been fundamental in the creation of Ashoka. And then the Ashoka story, I think Sanjeev needs to get all the credit because he really goaded and pushed everybody at that critical moment. Um, a lot of you may not know this, but we had a critical moment where this plot of land, there was a huge hole in the ground. It looked like a, a, a site where a meteor had crashed into the Rajiv Gandhi education city when we first visited. And we had this moment where, you know, we were unsure where should we, what should we do? The financial crisis had just passed. And 
we, somebody had to take the risk to put in the cap. We didn't even know if we would get the approvals, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember Sanjeev and I were at a common friend's house sitting in Garden Estate. Uh, the Yale, somebody had come down. And uh, in that lawn, sitting out there in winter nights, and he just said, boss, we just got to do it. Let's go 50-50. We got to make it happen. And there was some 48 hours to go before, or 24 hours to go before you could submit uh, the application for this land. And so it's that last minute goading on Sanjeev's part. And then this vision of sort of liberal arts, I think Sanjeev, has always been very clear that this is a very distinctive value proposition, something he deeply cared about. We had met, I used to work at the Oberoi Hotel some 10 years ago when I was in my private equity career, and we met, and we discovered we had a similar passion. And for him, it was always about the liberal arts. It wasn't just building a university, it wasn't just education. It was about a very distinctive model. And so he's, he stayed true to that all through. We went through some ebbs and flows as we were having these discussions, multivarsity, this, that, but it came back to that original vision that Sanjeev had. I met Ashish first in, uh, I think, late 99, early 2000. Uh, he had just come back from the US and, uh, uh, you know, uh, had begun his uh, venture capital fund. It was not a private equity fund in those days. And uh, we met in the Machan, right? uh, it was for breakfast. And uh, I was sort of nosing around trying to raise money. Uh, we now bootstrap Nokri for three years. Uh, and I had got this basic PowerPoint, you know, and, which I sort of took a printout of and went to meet him. And I remember one sentence which Ashish said, I still remember it. Uh, the best valuation is not necessarily the highest valuation. Okay, that stayed with me. So basically, we got a, a couple of offers, and uh, you know, for funding. And I told Ashish, "This is the offers we've got, and, and this is, you know, and one was higher than the other." And Ashish said, "The best valuation is not necessarily the highest valuation." Anyway, we, are, we, we took our funding, and Ashish uh, funded a competitor, yeah, uh, called Jobs Ahead. And uh, so, and, and uh, the, the principal, one of the principal founders of Jobs Ahead, is also a founder and trustee now, Puneet Dalmia, right? Uh, so it was early days in the internet when I met Ashish, and then often on I keep meeting him, uh, you know, at some event or the other. Um, and uh, I remember in 2007, uh, one of my uh, independent directors and uh, chairman of our, chair of our audit committee, Mr. Arun Duggal. Uh, so basically, what had happened was that uh, uh, I, I had gone to St. Stephen's College, and uh, you know, over IIT, and. Uh, you know, when I finished from Delhi University, I passed out uh, somewhat bewildered. You know, had I made the right choice, I wasn't sure, right? Because, uh, you know, Delhi University, I felt didn't challenge you at all, didn't push you at all. And uh, you could essentially study in the last two months and get a first division if you were smart enough, right? Uh, I got a second division. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I, uh, I passed out somewhat bewildered and, you know, did I do the right thing? And uh, I wasn't sure for the longest time. Uh, then over time, I figured that, look, uh, I, 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 I'm glad I went here. But, but I felt that, you know, Delhi University could be so much better, but, you know, not my problem, right? Uh, and uh, then I, along the way, I began to figure that, look, you know, something should be done about it. But the penny really dropped when um, St. Stephen's College declared uh, in 2007 50% uh, reservation uh, with a 35% gap in the cutoff between the general category and the uh, reserve category. And that got all uh, Stephen's alumni up in arms, saying that, look, uh, with a 35% gap, it's not about the reservation, it's about the gap. Uh, with a 35% gap, uh, you know, you're going to kill the academic uh, character of the place. Uh, but, uh, no, the, you know, nobody listened. And uh, so a few alumni got together and said, let's start a new college. I mean, I was there, I was saying, let's start a new college. And enough guys said, yes, we should start a new college. And then after two, three months of ranting, you know, everybody walked away. And then one of our independent directors, chairman of our audit committee, Mr. Arun Dugal, you know, he heard my story and he said, you know, uh, Sanjeev, up Ashish Dhawan se baat kar lije. You know, he's interested in education. So I had no clue that he was interested in education. So I reached out to him and I said, you know, I want to meet you. So, so Ashish, 
uh, said, uh, so I told him, listen, maybe it's time to start a new college. So I said, huh, good idea. Uh, so how much do you think it'll cost? So I said, uh, how much will you, uh, you know, fund? But I said, stretch, karke, man, you know, I can do five crores. She said, okay, I'll match you. So whatever you put, we'll match. Huh? Ashish is a really smart guy, right? So whatever you know, whatever you put, I'll match. Which means that whatever he puts, I have to match. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And Ashish is a really smart, smart investor. Hmm? Uh, so he is. I think uh, he had built a track record as I think India's most successful private equity investor before he decided to track it up and. Uh, you know, and, and you know, private equity is and venture capitalists have had a really hard time in India. Very few have made money. So India has not proved a happy hunting ground for this this class of investments. But I think Ashish, you know, was a standout, uh, you know, performance in that area. Uh, and uh, so Ashish, I discovered, was a person who was really a passionate about it, be interested, and C, you know. Uh, so Vineet came to me and said, you know, Pramath and I were discussing, uh, it's between you and Ashish who has to be chairman of the board of trustees, right? Now, so me, because I'm 10 years older, that's all, you know? <laughs> okay, not, 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 uh, not that I deserve it. So I uh, said, you know, I think it should be Ashish because uh, we need to raise money and he's gonna be really good at raising money. Uh, you know, and uh, Vineet didn't ask me a second time, okay? So obviously, Obviously, we need that brother hoping I'd say no, <laughs> but 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 they, no no. But so 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 we we, we sort of uh, decided that look, Ashish should be chairman of the board, and since then he's had I think two extensions or one extension, one, one extension. But I, I think he's only had a few more, uh, you know, uh, you know because and and people who have been I've been on a couple of roadshows with him, one roadshow, and I've seen him operate. I've been on a few meetings with him uh, to raise money, uh, but uh, there's a gentleman called Sang Gupta who's, uh, you know, represents uh, Ashoka in the US, common friend. And he is in the investment banking business, so he does fundraising for a living. And he's been helping Ashish. And he reports back to me, says, you know, I have not seen anybody like Ashish in fundraising pitches. He says he starts at 8 a.m. and doesn't stop till 11 p.m. And he goes meeting after meeting after meeting. So very high energy, very focused, very passionate, committed. And if Ashoka has been able to raise the money it has, uh, it's been that effort has been largely led by Ashish. Yeah, I think. <laughs> and when I first met Ashish, I said, "Look, 25 crore will be enough in my opinion." So I'll put five. I'll put five. Also, that's ten done. I said, "Now let's find three more." I think now we are talking about uh, two thousand crores. Uh, we're talking about two thousand crores. So it's uh, obviously I'm not good at math, yeah, right? <laughs> But, but Ashish is very good at raising money, and we are almost halfway there, right, to, to, to get there. Uh, so, so I think, uh, so Ashish's leadership of the board, Ashish's leadership in fundraising, Ashish's leadership in many strategic areas, not just in these areas, quality of thinking, I think that's helped Ashoka a lot. Uh, I think uh, the, the way Ashish has you know, kept a cool head in a crisis, the way Ashish has always told us uh, you know, we get many phone calls for admissions, and we get many phone calls from all sorts of people in all sorts of powerful places. And we've kept the admission process uh, so complex that nine people have to collude in case an undeserving candidate has to be given admission. And we did that deliberately because we didn't want anybody to, uh, you know, get in, uh, you know, unless he or she actually deserved, in our opinion. Uh, and we've faced so much pressure sometimes that we found it hard to resist. And we said, hey man, this one you have to do. And Ashish always stood back and said, guys, just hold the line. We have to say no. And I have called up cabinet ministers and said, no, I've done all sorts of things. Uh, and Ashish has said, has simply stood firm. He said, you can't let this happen. Right? So I think uh, when, I, when, I, when I look at uh, you know, uh, the IITs and the IIMs, one of the reasons why they're so, 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 so respected is because admissions are purely on merit. You cannot finger that admission process. I think uh, while we all have agreed, under extreme pressure, it is Ashish who has said always, no, hold the line. We can't say yes. And I think another couple of years of this, I think it will hold Ashoka in good stead and we'll build that reputation. 
uh, and people will stop calling us up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add one small thing, just to give you a glimpse of the way we operate. It's a very informal way of operating. You know, Sanjeev and I had this pact that we'll match each other and we meet this, what we call, we have a WhatsApp group called The Huddle, which is uh, Pramat and Vineet and Sanjeev and myself, and we WhatsApp each other. And there's full transparency, you know, on what's going on. There's no written document that says we have to communicate or we have to stay in touch. The idea of The Huddle was also we meet once a month. So our last meeting was at Smokehouse Delhi at 8 a.m. on Sunday. The Smokehouse Delhi opens at 8 a.m. on a Sunday. And I told these guys, I think the eggs there are good, let's meet there. So we met there and, you know, we discussed a whole bunch of things. And then outside, I, I wanted to speak to Sanjeev one-on-one. -on -one. So I chased him to his car to just say, and I said, listen, Sanjeev, you know, we've got this 2,000 crore thing. You and I have already given quite a bit. But I think it's time we just show a little bit extra and let's give, I'm think he's saying, what are you thinking? I said, maybe for now, 25 crore. He just looked at me and said, done. That's it, done, let's move on. I, I was back at my car, literally 30 seconds later. There was no discussion. It's like Sanjeev is like, it's done, okay. That's, that's the way he operates, so. So, sir, there are things about uh, synergy and building great ventures and uh, things like that we can only hope to be inspired and learn as we grow up. But something that we do understand full well is submitting something important f a few hours before the deadline ends. <laughs> we can understand that very well and uh, we want to know if this quintessentially Ashokan thing <laughs> of submitting something important and doing it well and doing it well a, a few hours within the deadline is true because when you are looking at things, I, I believe somewhere it came across, I don't know if it's true or not, that the money was finally deposited just a few hours before the deadline was over. So if you could tell us a bit about that. So, you know, uh, we had begun talking to about starting a university in 2007, right? Uh, initially there was, uh, you know, me and a bunch of Stephanians and uh, when uh, then I was left alone and then I went to Ashish and Ashish said, yeah, then there were two of us. Uh, and then we went to Pramat and then uh, we, we had a couple more people around us. And uh, meanwhile, Vineet and his IIT classmates and IIT friends were talking about building a technology university, right? Uh, and they also went to promote separately. So there were now two groups. There was one liberal arts group, which is Ashish and me, and there was seven or eight guys from IIT. Uh, and finally, Pramat said, listen, I can't do so many meetings. Why don't the two of you merge? In any case, you can't do it alone. Uh, so why don't two of you merge and start a multi-different university, liberal arts and technology and social sciences and this and that. So uh, we met Vineet, uh, I met Vineet and I met Ashish Gupta, uh, you know, at a conference and we chatted about five minutes and I said, yeah, fine, we can, you know, we can, we can see if we can work together. And I told Ashish, I said, look, I met these guys, we also meet them, let's go for a couple of meetings, see what happens. So we organized a couple of meetings, I mean, Pramath's office, Ashish's office, and uh, we agreed that we'll work together. It's better to pool forces. Now, so initially, so, you know, there was a lot of uh, grand plans. And so, you know, we'd meet up and there'd be business plans and research and, you know, 300 acres, why not 800 acres? You know, uh, how much land does Stanford have? You know, uh, blue sky's thinking, right? <laughs> we'll get the money. It's okay, we'll get the money, right? Okay, a lot of talk, right? Uh, and. Nothing happened actually, and then the meltdown happened, and nobody's feeling rich anymore. Uh, and uh, you know, initially we, we had thought we'd get agricultural land and convert it, you know, into institutional, but we found that very hard to do. So we put an application. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi Edu City Kondli was coming up, and we got the allotment. And the allotment said that you have to pay 25 percent advance within 12 months of this, right? But nobody's feeling rich, right? So. So the uh, allotment party we here, right? Uh, meanwhile, you know, Ashish had a great idea uh, a year before that, saying, why don't we start a, a part in you know, our program, uh, which is a one-year post-grad program. It could be a certificate program. And Pramat swung the UPenn collaboration. He's uh, you know, alumnus of UPenn. 
And we started the YIF out of a rented campus in uh, Aurobindo Ashram uh, as a one-year experiment, one time. Right? And the course was designed, and visiting faculty came from overseas and from India, and we said we will uh, not charge fees. It's an experiment. People are taking, risking their money of their lives. We should at least put, you know, they should not have to pay money also. And the, the, that program proved to be a great success, right? Uh, it was, a, students liked it, faculty liked it, people got jobs, right? Uh, you know, I mean, three things in place, <laughs> <laughs> right? So we said, okay, let's fund it for one year more, and let's see what happens. Secondly, also no fees. Then it became permanent. Now this is going on on the side. It's not a university yet. It is just a certificate program, okay? And this land came, and then uh, one day I got a call from Pramath saying, you know, abhi ek mahina baki hai, to land chali jayegi, to kya karna hai? <laughs> so the Yale president was visiting, and Ashish, uh, you know, undergrad from Yale, and uh, uh, there was a dinner at uh, Garden Estate at a uh, gentleman's house, uh, Ranjit Shastri. Ranjit Chastri, I think his wife is Yale, right? An anu is Yale. Both, are, both are from Yale. So they were hosting the Yale president, so they invited me also. Uh, I was there, Prabod Basin was there, Ashish was there, a few other people were there. So uh, after a couple of drinks, yeah? That's the important <laughs> After a couple of drinks, I took Ashish out of the garden. I said, they land yari hai. Now, you see, Ashish and I had a little bit of angst also, because you know, there were just two of us who were liberal arts guys, and there were 10 guys from IIT, you know, in that. <laughs> okay, and they would tell me, you know, Koini uh, Sanjeev, don't worry, fine arts will be You know? <laughs> <laughs> so Ashish Dhawan told Ashish Gupta, the boss, fine arts is not liberal arts. <laughs> 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 So I said, Dek, aisa hai. Ashik, nobody's putting up the money. Now, if you and I put up 25% of the money, they go, se kar you can't do a uh, university which has got engineering also and technology also. And, you know, pachis ekar hai. Kya karoge? So let's start with pachis ekar and let's say that because you and I are putting the money, it must be liberal arts first. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Ashik said, okay. And this is not this is not 24 hours before the deadline. This is about uh, I think four five days before the deadline, maybe six days before the deadline, <laughs> right? So next day I called up Pramath. I said, "Boss, it's like this. Uh, Ashwin and I have spoken. We'll put up that 25 percent, right? And uh, but it'll be liberal first. Can you persuade you know the others?" So Pramath was anchoring. You know, he was the bridge between liberal arts and technology. Yeah. <laughs> So Pramod said, okay, uh, let me talk to them. Uh, so there was two, three days of, I believe, discussion, negotiation, which Ashish and I were not privy to. And finally they got back, said, with great reluctance, okay, we'll do it, but at some point in time, we should also do technology. <laughs> so we said, ha, ha, some. <laughs> so then, uh, you know, now the truth is, I didn't have that much money unless I sold shares and the market was at the bottom, right? So I just, uh, you know, sold everything else I had, uh, you know, in, uh, other than the shares in the company. And uh, I managed to get my 12.5%. And Ashish also did it. And we moved the money. And we submitted it a few hours before the deadline. Uh, the morning, I think by 11 o'clock, the deadline was 5 o'clock or something like that. Okay, but it took six, seven days to mobilize. Right? And that's how it happened. So that's how Ashoka is a liberal arts university. <laughs> Fine arts or liberal arts, Sanjeev? Fine arts, we can link it. So, sir, when you talk about Ashoka, it seems like one of those beautiful ideas that we have on our whiteboard under someday, maybe. And it'll work when it has to. So, when you finally got to it, what was it like? Were you pretty confident that it'll work? Or was it something more like, uh, I think the screen will explain it better. Doctor, are you sure this will work? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, so <laughs> was it more of a gamble or a project undertaken with full confidence? 
You want to start? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think somewhere deep inside we knew that the time was right. That uh, even though in our time when we finished school, maybe, you know, Sanjeev was a big risk taker, but there weren't that many that would have been, would have openly said, I'm unsure about what I want to do, that I'll fight with my parents to do this. Um, India had changed. And so our sense was that the time had come for a liberal arts program to be started. And that I think we were pretty confident of. That, you know, the time was right. Um, lots of kids were going abroad to the US. Even things like IB schools and all were catching on, although they're very expensive. You know, so the time seemed to be right. Um, so I think there we were quite confident that if we had a 20, 30, 40 year view, that this was going to be a great starting point and that Ashoka could you know, be a trendsetter, be a pioneer. I think where we were very underconfident was what's going to happen like six months from now, 12 months from now, you know, the, the near term kind of stuff. Are we really going to be able to get the funds to get this thing going? The first batch, you know, when you go out there and market it, are you going to get like 50 applications or a thousand applications? You know, because it's a new university, you have no idea. And so you can put any numbers out there so I think we were not sure about what the receptivity of the program would be. From a faculty standpoint, I think thanks to the YF, there were a number of founding faculty who joined because they already were familiar. Um, so I think the YF helped a lot in, in, as a proof of concept to show that this can work and it can be run really well. And if it's run well, the demand will increase. But I think there was, it, to be honest, I think it's blown all our expectations. In, when people talk about Ashoka University as a well-established university today, I don't think anybody could have imagined at that time, sitting even six years ago, or even four years ago, when the campus, the undergrad program was being conceived of, that this would be such a well-known university so quickly. So whether it was the financial model, whether it was fundraising to get the additional capital for CapEx. Most of you may know we initially only built the first few buildings in the front, largely because we only had money for that. And so to build phase two, phase three, four, phase, I mean, Sanjeev and I had said, we'll put in more money. So there's a backstop. We will commit more funds, you know, and there were points in time when we ran out of money and we had to put some money in to keep it going. But you know, it's those kinds of, so it was genuinely a startup where there were a lot of teething problems, a lot of things along the way, particularly the first couple of years. When we started out, if somebody had said, yeah, we would not have done it. Right? We first started out saying uh, 25 crores. So, you know, it's a sum that, you know, you can comprehend. Right? And say, so, okay, fine, we can raise that kind of money. Right? Uh, so we took it in incremental steps, right? Uh, the first YF batch cost five crores. I think 30, 40, 50 people contributed, right? Some large numbers contributed to make it happen. Right? It was one one-off experiment. Other than that, there was no expenditure. We had not. We were just me doing meetings in uh, Ashish's office, and um, he was paying for the coffee, right? Right. Uh, so because we took it in bite-sized chunks, because we first did the YF on a small scale, uh, got comfortable, we felt emboldened, dusa sal karo, right? Uh, we applied for the land, uh, it came, okay, there's 25% upfront, the rest you can pay over, uh, I think 10 years, 12 years, something like that, right? So you can pay it out. Okay, you can get the land and not build, how does that matter? You know, you can always back out, there's no problem. And then we said, okay, fine, uh, first plan, right? Okay, first plan is this. Uh, I think the first plan was 450 crores or something like that. It was not what it is today, okay? By then, Ashish was rounding up money. So it looked like we could get there, or he might get there. So it's because we took it in incremental steps and did not do the full financial projection in the beginning that we were not intimidated, uh, you know, and uh, we had the courage to do it, in my view. Hello, hello, yeah. 
Thank you. So next up, we have a question from Mr. Hitesh Obrai, who's currently serving as the CEO of Nokri. Hi, Ashish. Hi, Sanjeev. Pardon the video quality. I'm doing this in a moving car. My question to both of you is, you must have seen a lot of ups and downs in the Ashoka journey to get to where we are today. So at what point in the journey were you convinced that you're going to make it? I think different levels of conviction at different points. I, I think the first uh, sign was really when 900 applicants came in for the founding YF batch. I think it blew everybody's mind. 900 really high quality applicants. And these were not just ordinary, I mean, 900 people bothered to write the essays. You know, these, many of them had been to IIT, Stevens, et cetera, and they were applying for this no name Young India Fellowship one year, we don't know what we'll get out of it kind of program. So I think that was a first signal that, look, something's in. I think a second signal was when those students, the first 57, 58 were, had been in the program for a couple of months. And they were just rah, rah, rah about the program. I mean, they were just, this is better than what we have seen at, in our undergraduate institutions. This is just mind-blowing. The quality of faculty is unbelievable. The experience is totally different. The peer learning is completely different. So a certain level, oh my God, this thing actually can, like Sanjeev is saying, live beyond a year, right? And actually go on to a second year. So I think there was many steps leading up to the university. I think we were still unsure about whether we'd get the university license or not. There's a whole process here. There's an inspection that happened, you know, in 2013 both the state, the UGC, there was uncertainty around that. But I think the idea was validated through the YF. And then again, the first undergrad batch, you know, was another marker where the founding batch, where again, you know, about a thousand people uh, applied. They were from some of the best schools across the country. Uh, they were very enthusiastic to join. The acceptance rates were higher than what we expected. The faculty who joined coming out of the YF were some of the best, you know, who took up the offer. Um, so by then, I think there was a sense that, look, this, there is a viable proposition here. What our initial hunch was that the time for liberal arts has come, you know, that the students really want this, the parents want this. Maybe the parents are still a little bit of a wet blanket, but that's okay, but, you know. So, but early on, my first marker was the YF, if you ask me. I think that pilot just showed the potential. And then somewhere when this physical campus was up and running, we got cleared, the Haryana legislature cleared us, the applications came in, I think we knew we were on to something. So, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you keep looking at risks and what's the worst case scenario, right? And uh, until we launched the YF, we had spent nothing and lost nothing, yeah, other than time, okay? When we did the YF, uh, the first batch, it cost a total of 5 CR, of which I think uh, Ashish and I had put in a certain percentage, and the rest came from uh, many people. Uh, and uh, when that worked, you know, in my head it was, okay, in worst case scenario, we can run this YF on a rented campus forever, because, you know, this amount, sum of money is reasonable, affordable, and outcomes are good. Right? So, I knew we had something, if not an university, something, by the time the first YF batch was over. The next big leap was, look, now there's a quantum jump in expenditure, when you actually committed to the land, and said, the to university banegi, you know, which meant that there'll be even more. And like Ashish, when the first batch went in, okay, uh, we were staring at a reasonably large deficit, uh, annual deficit. But by the, by the second year, you know, it looked like, okay, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, there have been different markers when, you know, it was about two years ago, I remember I, I was in the U.S. and I met with the president of the Yale, I went to Princeton, I met the president of Stanford. And the fact that these people already had heard of Ashoka, before you got there, was like, a, just blew my mind. That somehow this word had traveled through academic circles, and these people knew about Ashoka. Another marker, just this weekend, 
So on Saturday, there was this India Philanthropy Initiative, which Bill Gates had come for, and it's basically, Mr. Premji pulls it together, and it's a uh, hundred philanthropists from around India who come and, or people who could be future philanthropists. And they did a, Pratap and I did a session on the power of institutions. And we had in the room, Sunil Mittal taking notes, you know, Sunil Munjar from Hero taking notes, Azim Premji sitting there, listening to what Ashoka is doing. I mean, literally, the who's who of corporate India sitting there saying, this is the model. And listening intently in terms of what we managed to pull off here, because they all, Sunil is going to announce on the 23rd, a big university. And we've been talking to him already. But you know, for, him, for them, this is really what they look up to. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, one other thing. If you start something, you know, you want it to endure, and I mean, you can't shut it. Certainly, university, you cannot shut, right? Uh, okay, and therefore, once you start it, you know, you're committed. Right, YF, we started it. You know, we knew that we could continue it because, you know, we had found a reasonable model, right? I think the first couple of years, having committed to land, campus, university, different level of uh, investment expenditure, uh, we said, yeah, you can't stop this now. Okay, because uh, people, students, students' parents, uh, you know, faculty, uh, you know, they're committing their lives. The Ashoka University brand will live with you on your CV forever, right? Uh, we can't shut it. So we had to sort of take a deep breath and say, okay, come what may, now we're going to do it. Right? And I think that sort of, uh, uh, before we committed to the, uh, you know, to actually constructing on the land, uh, you know, we, I think, went through it in our heads and said, okay, this is it now. Uh, so, on that earlier point that you said about the faculty, uh, Sanat and I both joined in the founding batch, and uh, I think what uh, really made me confident uh, in opposition to things that my parents were saying, the other places I could have gone to, uh, the one argument that really just won it for me were the people behind Ashoka. Uh, and of course, th the founders and, uh, where they <coughs> and their expertise and the leadership in the industry is one. But the faculty really blew our minds uh, to understand that, okay, if I go to Stephens, I go to uh, this particular competitive college, I'll get these professors, and this is the setup of the curriculum. Uh, but when it came to Ashoka, we saw the kind of faculty we would get, we saw the kind of curriculum we would get, and our minds were blown, and that's what really sold it for us. So what was really the approach into academia? We understand it began with the YF, but how did, what was the, uh, what was your, uh, angle when you were approaching academia and what were your goals? I think the first thing is, you know, the recognition that, look, we are not academics. We don't know how to run a university. Um, Pramat had been the first dean of the ISB, but even Pramat is not a hardcore academic. So I think as we came together, the first thing we said is the humility to say, look, we may be putting in the money, we may even organize the land, think of the vision, et cetera. But unless we have top class academics involved, this is not going to work. And so the idea of setting up an academic council, uh, Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who's now the vice chancellor, was one of the first two or three people who joined the academic council. And there were several others, uh, Professor Andre Bete, you know, Ram Guha, et cetera. I would say Pramath played a, a seminal role in getting many of these people on board. Uh, and, uh, but I think that recognition was there, that we need this core group of 10 people who will advise us, who really will be friends of the university. They may not have permanent positions at the institution, but they are folks who will help us attract great faculty. They are people who will help us think through the vision of the institution, et cetera. So that recognition was there from the outset, that look, we are we, we may be good at doing certain things, but this is a shared governance model, and it always will be. And so even from the outset, you know, a lot of private universities, you see the chancellor is often one of the folks, the moneyed folks, you know, at, it'll be a family member or something like that. In our model, when Sanjeev and I set this up, it, the unique governance model is we said, we'll only have one vote each. Other people who come in will have a vote as well. And so it's a shared governance on the trustee side, and we will never interfere with academics. 
There's, the faculty have a critical role to play, and probably the most important role to play in building the institution. And so really it's a partnership between the two. And so bringing on board the right people at the outset is critical. Professor Mukherjee, as you know, is a star professor in the Young India Fellowship Program. He was, uh, I think, the highest rated professor two or three years running. Uh, he had just come back to teaching. He loved it. Uh, and so when the idea of the university became real and the initial conversation with uh, Rudrangshu was had around potentially becoming the first vice chancellor, he was super excited because I think, you know, from being at the Telegraph to now teaching at the YF, he just could see the, the potential for this project. Um, and so Andre and, and Rudrangshu were a great team coming on board to help build the university and the founding faculty who came on board also, as you're saying, you know, you, your parents may not have, or you may not have had the confidence with just the people behind it. It was also, which is why a lot of the faculty members, if you notice your year particularly, were out on the road, going to different cities, doing faculty talks, etc. is because if it weren't for that group of faculty, you wouldn't have known what this institution is gonna be about. So this was always a partnership between the founders and faculty from the outset and a recognition that, you know, whilst the founders play an important role, it's great faculty that make a great institution. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, although I would have loved to ask you more questions, I think we leave time for audience. But before that, a quick rapid fire round for you two. Uh, so I'll leave it. So I think Gurashish will be uh, asking questions to Mr. Bhishtindani and I'll talk to you. So. Uh, all right. So <laughs> the round will have two parts. One is word association, and the other one is uh, just a quick answer. So the first part is uh, uh, to Sir, uh, uh, and this just top of the head. Your favorite founder, apart from Mr. Thorne? Prabhatan Vinith. Your favorite dean? Your favorite of the deans, among the deans? Among the deans, uh, I think uh, Jonathan Gil Harris. Faculty member? Mahesh Rangarajan. Your, your favorite? Mahesh, Mahesh and I went to school together. <laughs> <laughs> your favorite moment in the Ashoka journey? There are many, but I think whenever there's a third party acknowledgement of Ashoka, um, and most of all when students' parents come to me. So my first boss uh, in my first job, uh, his uh, daughter got into Ashoka, and is she here? Mahi? <laughs> Mahi is here? No? Okay. Uh, she's in first year. She's in first year. And uh, she got Stephens as well. And. Uh, uh, her father called me up and said, listen, I mean, she's got Stephen Ashoka, she wants to do history, and um, what do you think? You know, now uh, I'm also, uh, you know, a Stephenian, and uh, uh, I was also on the Alumni Foundation of St. Stephen's College of Trustee, and uh, so I said, look, uh, I might be biased, but I'd say Ashoka, uh, you know, and uh, it's possible that uh, for the next five, seven years, uh, you know, Ashoka brand will not be in the Stephen's, but uh, let me tell you, education is already better. Okay, uh, and another five, seven years, it'll also be a bigger brand because you're talking about a legacy of 150 years there. Uh, but why don't you talk to another parent? And I introduced him to the parent of uh, another student who's in fourth year now, um, also doing history, or is it uh, Paul Science, I think. And uh, uh, they spoke, and she's here. And uh, the whole family is saying we took the right, right call. So I think when, when parents of students acknowledge, uh, you know, it's, it gives me the greatest joy. The toughest moment in the journey to Ashoka? Well, I think, I think we've always uh, been trying to raise money. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, so basically the tough moment was that uh, when we first said this 25 acres, let's do liberal arts first, we also gave a commitment, Ashish and I, that we also commit to fund it. Uh, and whether or not we're able to raise money from elsewhere. Uh, the two of us will stand behind it. 
And I think uh, it took us about, uh, I think, 15 minutes to sort of uh, discuss that commitment, and then we made it. And, uh, and thus far, it's worked out. All right, a few uh, word associations now. Uh, the founding badge. I think uh, risk takers, pioneers, uh, because uh, they uh, it's, uh, took a risk with their lives. There was no reputation there. The Young India Fellowship. Okay, you're not going to like this. How many YI fellows here? <laughs> okay, so I don't mean it. But, but when the name was first suggested, you know, uh, everybody loved it except me. And I said, man, uh, there's a, there was a brand of uh, uh, men's undergarments called Young India. <laughs> you know, and I said, and I said you, can't, you can't call it Young India Fellowship. Okay. But anyway, I, I was overruled. <laughs> uh, no. They didn't know that till now, Sajid. <laughs> I'm, gl I'm glad our brand is more salient. Uh, as an as a undergraduate student here, special thank you for the last one. <laughs> <laughs> no, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, uh, I think the YF program is uh, truly unique and... Uh, <laughs> I, and it's a, it's a YF program that has made Ashoka's name. Uh, now, a fan Let me also tell you, I have, I have, ter I have terrible judgment in uh, choice of names. So, uh, when uh, the Ash name Ashoka was first suggested, uh, I had opposed that also. <laughs> I had said, yeah, uh, too cliched, but anyway. Uh, I was overruled again, and, uh, you know, it's worked out. A <laughs> uh, fan favorite here, the University Grants Commission. Largely supportive. I think uh, we've, uh, if you do good work, see what I have learned about Government of India is that if you do good work and they're convinced that, look, your intentions are clean, you're not here to make money, uh, you find many doors open and there's a lot of support. It takes a little time, but there's a lot of support. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, first question <coughs> who comes to your mind when I say the following? Um, favorite professor? Uh, Kranti. Your idol? Benjamin Franklin. Luckiest person on earth? Me. <laughs> <laughs> you want to elaborate on that? God's been kind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Happiest person on earth? My son. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Vision Come home and you'll see. <laughs> okay, next. Scary. Scary. The Kashmir issue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going there, huh? <laughs> um, childhood. Fun. Okay. Uh, so next question. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the following? Party. Huge party animal. <laughs> Beer. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Beer. <laughs> Beer are white. Innovative. The no no. <laughs> the the new Gates toilet. Okay. Uh, your dream car. Your dream car. Honda? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> anyway, I don't care about cars, so. Okay, <laughs> I don't. Um, Yale. A lot of fun. Blast. Transformative experience, really, more than anything else. Wall Street. Too greedy. Not my type. Okay. Um, home. Peaceful. Your most valuable asset. My reputation. Thank you. Okay. So now uh, we'll take audience questions. Keep your questions as short as possible so that we can have uh, maximum boss. Okay, Samyak first. Do we have anyone? Yeah, 
Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, so you spoke of a shared governance model. Now, sir, in your vision for Ashoka, what role do you think existing models of governance, like the YFs have their committees and the undergraduates have their student government, what role do you think such institutions uh, can play in the larger Ashokan vision? Yeah, so I think when we talk about the shared governance model, it's important to all stakeholders have an important voice in the university. I think from a decision, it's, there's a difference between voice and what things you make decisions over, decision-making rights. So when it comes to faculty appointment, founders don't have a role. We just look at some policies at the broad level. It's really left to the vice chancellor and faculty. When it comes to things that have a money implication, fi financial implication, really faculty can make suggestions, it can come up, but really it is the governing body that has to decide. So there are a set of, even though there's a shared governance model, I think the decision-making rights are very clear in terms of who has decision-making rights. I think from a student standpoint, you can't let the university be run by students. It has to be run by the academics, the governing structures, etc. But it's very, very important that there are certain aspects of the, the university, particularly with relate to students, student life, athletics, where students should play a key role in, in running those parts of the university. And then on other areas like academics, or whether it's the, the ethos of the university, feedback from students is critical. So I think the, it's just a question of, you know, feedback is really important, but in some areas, the decision-making rights have to be very, very clear in terms of building the institution. I think in terms of the governance model, the way we looked at it is ultimately, students play a very important role because we all will get off the board of trustees. And our model is that alumni actually will take over as trustees, not our children of Ashoka. So ultimately, it is the alumni who run, who will be trustees of this university. And that's really the American model. And I think one of the reasons why some universities have managed to perpetuate for so long is because its family members are not involved. It's really the alumni, the students, who care most about their alma mater who are really giving back financially in terms of time and then eventually giving back by serving as trustees of the institution. So that's the model in a nutshell. You see, uh, in the beginning, right, uh, when we were just discussing, right, uh, I still have that document somewhere on my hard disk. I'll email it to you, uh, you know, uh, Ashish. Uh, so we had said that we will invite like-minded people with the right values to come on board as founders. And to be on the board of trustees, you have to commit X, a certain sum of money, right? Above, below, you know, to, to get onto the board. But the pre-qualification is that you have to be invited. You have to be like-minded, right? It's not just anybody with a checkbook can come, right? And initially, the thinking was very corporate, right? Which is that uh, if you put X, you get one board seat. If you get two X, you get two board seats, and so on, right? So, uh, so very quickly, Ashish Nari is 2x, right? And uh, so then uh, I put out a mail saying, as per the earlier understanding, uh, you know, Ashish and I uh, should get uh, two board seats each, right? And there was a meeting in Pramat's house, uh, I think, uh, and Pramat said, listen, we can do that, but I think we should revise that and let's make it a shared governance model where no matter how much you give, you get only one board seat. Right? And we discussed and debated that. It was a conscious decision and an understanding that, look, uh, the best universities in the world uh, don't belong to any one person or one family or, uh, you know, uh, with one sort of group having too much influence. Uh, it's a shared collective ownership. It is collective philanthropy. Uh, and therefore, uh, you can... You, you must not take more than, and we agreed, and we, we, we all agreed, and since then it's been that, and we walked away from several donors who have said, okay, I'm giving 5x, I want five board seats, uh, I want majority, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, we felt that is not the right way for Ashoka to go. Uh, you know, when you look at universities uh, like Cambridge, Oxford, uh, you know, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, uh, it's very broad-based uh, governance, uh, and, and I think uh, that is one principle you stayed with, that's also ensured 
that actually faculty get independence, actually vice chancellor gets independence. It's not uh, a single person uh, ownership. I'll relate a couple of stories because it's always, these things always boil down, you can lay out principles, but it always boils down to those tough moments when you need to decide. So early on, I remember there was a very, there was a three page spread in Economic Times on Ashoka. It was a Sunday edition of the Economic Times. You, some of you may remember, it was three pages on Ashoka. And there was a leading top 10 uh, Indian industrialist, top five, who is visiting from Bombay, who's in Delhi, staying at his house. And I got a call from him. I was actually skiing in Austria. I had just woken up early in the morning. And uh, I said, listen, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not. He said, I just saw this article. I hadn't seen it myself. And I want to visit today. I said, it's a Sunday. He said, no, 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 today. I said, fine. I called up uh, Pramath, I called up Gil, and we had a team of five people, a couple of alums, uh, key founders, faculty, etc. meet with him. He got back saying, very interested. I was back that Thursday, so it was a Sunday, went to meet him in Bombay, said, I'm willing to cut you guys a 200 crore check. And this was very early on. You know, the 200 crore would have been huge. But here are the conditions. I want four board seats because I'm writing the big check versus everybody else, et cetera, et cetera. We came back, we discussed it. I think we, we had a fairly easy answer saying, sorry, this is not our model. We can't take the money. So it always boils down to those moments because you could, it would have been easy to compromise and say, let's, let's make it two. Let's negotiate. Yeah, take two. We'll take the money. It would have been a game changer. You know, similarly, there have been cases where a guy who I backed, actually, his company just went public. And uh, we went to him and said, listen, we want you to join the show. He's a good guy. He's a good entrepreneur, et cetera. Built a leading company. And we want you to join the Ashoka family, become a trustee. He said, listen, I'll give you a 10 crore check, but my son is in 10th grade. Can you just assure that he gets a, a place into Ashoka when he you know, finishes class 12. And I turned to Venkar and I said, let's abort this discussion, let's move on. We're not talking to this guy anymore. I know this guy and we just said, listen, this is not the way we operate. Thank you very much. And I've never gone back to him, never gone back. Yeah, hello, sir. Uh, one of the questions which I'm often asked by my bureaucratic relatives is that your university pays your professors a good package. It, I mean, it runs a very high class facility over there and it also offers need blind scholarship to many of the students. How far will your university survive? I need to give them an answer. Could you please suggest us? Very far. No, but uh, to give a serious answer. See, this is a question we grapple with. I think uh, it's really important that Ashoka is inclusive, right? And therefore, our internal discussion, although we've not made a official grand announcement about it, is that nobody should not attend Ashoka because he or she could not afford to pay, right? At the same time, what we are saying is that, look, this is not a government university where, uh, you know, there's a flat subsidy for everybody. Uh, and uh, even the rich or the better off uh, pay the same government fees. But the truth is uh, this university has to be sustainable eventually, right? Now, we, there are a lot of donors putting in a lot of money uh, for capex, for land, for infrastructure expansion. But when all that is done, you know, uh, you need the university to be sustainable on annual operations when the capex is over, right? Uh, and you can build a corpus, you can invest the corpus and uh, you know, in, in return on that and the deficit can be plugged. And naturally we'll try and do that you know, after the initial capex is over. And till then, uh, you know, we are running a deficit and uh, the founders are committed to fund the deficit. So I think our plan is and our intention is and our will is that uh, we will be need blind yeah, on admissions and scholarships will be on need. Yeah, I think you know, it's a function of the model so as I said earlier, if you want to build a top class university, it's, it's all about faculty. 
I think we quickly realized that if you look at the Chinese, they've done a great job building some of their top universities. If you look at Tsinghua or Peking or Fudan today, they're and the Chinese are very clear. They want nine of their universities, the C9, to be in the top 50 in the world. And they're pumping, and they're all government run, pumping lots of money. One of the reasons they've succeeded is the, because of the sea turtles. Sea turtles are the Chinese who've gone back home, right? They pulled in academics from the US, UK, wherever they are, Australia, to come back to China. I remember once I was at Yale, and they did this program for the top Chinese universities, the 20 of the top universities, their presidents were there. And it was interesting, about 15 of them were sea turtles, people who had been abroad and were lured back by the Chinese. And when we looked at it, we said, look, the great academics in India, obviously that's a pool we can tap into, but we don't want to just pinch from other universities. What's, I think, wonderful about Indians is they've gone all over the world. But no university in India has constructed a model. There are some, but not too many where you make it attractive for faculty to come back. And some of our best now are going abroad for PhD programs, particularly in the humanities and social sciences. So how do you lure them back? Obviously, higher comp versus a state university is critical. But it's not just compensation. It's also academic freedom, less bureaucracy, research budget, et cetera. So that's the Ashoka model. It's more expensive per student because we want better faculty. And because it's more expensive, the fees are higher, and because the fees are higher, we need to make sure we have a financial aid program so that it's inclusive. So that's the way it's been constructed, but we we'll still lose money, but we will be sustainable in the next sort of three years. We're, fin we're business people, financial people, in that we at least understand numbers. We're not looking to make money here, but we want to make sure this lasts a long time. So it's sustainable, we're prudent. You know, we have about 200 crore in undrawn funds money committed from people we haven't taken. Because at every point in time, we want a buffer. You never know. Something could go wrong, etc. So I think this university will go very far because we've thought through it carefully. we planned every aspect of it, and we're conservative from a planning perspective. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Um, I've joined fairly recently, and before I signed on the dotted line, I spoke to a lot of journalists in the education sector to find out what they thought of Ashoka. And I was very surprised, since media never agrees on anything, that they all had something very nice to say about Ashoka. So my question to you is this. What does future success look like to you? What is your ambition for Ashoka? I'll, I'll let Sanjeev just answer in a minute, but I'll start. You know, we are having to think through this right now very, we've thought through it obviously before, but it's, we're detailing it out further because there's this um, document we're preparing right now um, around a longer term vision. We have a five year plan, but we're now looking at a 2032 plan. So I think what we have always discussed as trustees is Ashoka is a, the model is sort of like Princeton, where, you know, Princeton has about 8,000 students uh, so call it 8,000, 10,000 students, something like that. It's got a strong undergraduate program. Undergrads make up almost 60, 65%. So the difference between Princeton and Harvard is, Harvard is about 35% undergrad. And you go to Harvard, the best professors are not necessarily teaching at the undergrad program. They're focused more on the grad schools. At Princeton, they are teaching in the undergrad program as well. Princeton does not have graduate, professional graduate schools. It doesn't have a business school, a law school, a medical school. But it has very strong graduate programs in the sciences, humanities, social sciences. So that, in a sense, is that we will obviously be contextualized to India, not just a copycat model. But that's the future model. I think what's critical is what Ashoka has managed to do so far is we've built a fairly good teaching model. I think, by and large, the reason why students come here is because they're good faculty, interesting pedagogy, holistic assessment, the teaching model, I think, is quite powerful, and that's what's getting students to apply. I think where we have not proven ourselves as yet is as a research university. And I think one of uh, Pratap and Malabika and many others who are part of the leadership team here is really to work on, in the next five years, to really build up the, leadership, the research, and it'll be a longer journey, but really in the next five years, start to build up the research profile of the institution. We have great faculty who are research active, but to create the right incentives, the right money, build graduate programs. We don't have 
the masters in economics just started, but really build graduate programs across the disciplines, PhD, masters. So I think graduate schools, research, the sciences, making sure the science is distinctive, these would probably be three key priorities in the next five years. Uh, you know, if I look back over the last 10 years, and what are the various aspirations that we've had for Ashoka? What are the, some of the principles or strategies or whatever? Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, one big aspiration that we have for Ashoka is that we will create a new model which will then be emulated and copied by hundreds of others because in a country of 1.3 billion people, you need a thousand Ashokas, right? So the way we put it is, look, the government created three IMs, two IMs, and then added a few others. And when they began to work and their graduates succeeded, right? Uh, uh, there were 4,000 business schools that came up. Some good, some mediocre, some bad. But the model got emulated. Uh, likewise, the government had the IITs. And when their graduates succeeded, uh, a few thousand engineering colleges came up. We are confident that if we do a good job of Shoka, we will get copied. And when we do get copied by good people, we will open our doors and say, we'll tell you how to do it, come in. And I think there are several universities now looking at it, several groups of people looking at it to set up more liberal arts universities in the country. And many of them are talking to us already. So one aspiration is to catalyze the transformation of Indian college education by setting up one great university and then hopefully that will get emulated. Right? Second aspiration is that, look, uh, if you look at uh, you know, middle class India, so you know, I, I, whenever I used to go and talk at the IIMs and the IITs and give all, all the good colleges, uh, I used to ask a question, uh, where I, more than once I've asked, how many of us are, have parents in uh, government, public sector, railways, police, defense, uh, nationalized banks, public insurance companies, and roughly about 50 or 60% of the hands would go up, right? Then I'd say, of the remaining, how many of us have parents in, who are working in employment? Another 20%. How many of us describe ourselves as middle class? 90%. So essentially, it is the Indian middle class, right, that uh, flogs its children to do well in studies because they say that, look, uh, this is the only way you can make it. We have, you have nothing to inherit. And that is my, my parents love that too, right? Uh, and so we work hard. And so we do well in studies. So we get admission into good colleges, right? Uh, so the, 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 the problem with the Indian middle class also is that there is this massive, massive, massive quest among parents for financial security, right? So, beta IIT ka exam clear karlo, life ban jayegi. Acha engineering karlo, agar IIT nahi mila to, right? Or medicine karlo, or no, acha ye IIM ka entrance exam clear karlo. I think all great things, right? But the truth is, uh, you know, kids get pushed into courses of study that they are not necessarily deeply passionate about or interested in. Okay. Uh, the truth also is that. Uh, most kids who go to IITs don't work as engineers. They took a safe option. They're good at studies. They took a safe option, uh, and they went to IIT, right? Uh, and then they took the next safe option and went to IIM, right? So middle class India pushes its kids to take safe options, where there's a reasonably guaranteed outcome of a job or a secure future, you know, financial security, okay? Uh, and I think that's great. I mean, that's, that's logical, sensible, and, and, and that's fine, right? Uh, what we want to do is create a model where it's a safe option to also do liberal, liberal arts, right? Because from my understanding and experience, uh, organizations that are looking for talented people go to the IITs and IIMs not because they have been specifically trained to do that job. In some cases, yes, but in most cases, no. They go there because they know the entrance exam and stuff. So we are guaranteed a certain quality, and therefore you go there. So if you can get a high quality cohort here, and they can study the subjects they want to study, and therefore width and then depth, therefore width and then choice of major, therefore you can change your major from the one that you came in with, right? 
Uh, as long as we are focusing on rigor, on quality, on quality of people who get it, and then quality in what happens here, right? Uh, we are confident that we can produce an institution, we can create an institution uh, that will challenge this orthodox middle class mindset. And there was, I think I can go on, there were eight to ten different aspirations, but these are just two I want to talk about here. I think we can take two more questions. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, sir. I'm from the current batch of the YF. And uh, you spoke quite a lot about how the YF has impacted the Ashoka brand and the Ashoka journey. Uh, if you could just shed some light on where do you see the YF going from here on and how it fits in with your long-term goals and the vision you've set for Ashoka. It'll really help us. Uh, so I'll give uh, a simple rudimentary answer the way I understand it. But I'm not the person on the board who influences uh, the decisions on YF the most. Uh, so it's like this. The YF was initially started as, hey, there's a recession, there's a global financial crisis. Uh, we can't start the university right away because we don't have enough money. Let's start a one-year program as a one-off, one-time experiment and see what happens. Right? And this should be a postgraduate program because people after school will not be taking a risk on a certificate program and not after one year go to a regular college. Right? And what are the concept? The concept was that, look, uh, so this whole thing started off with a belief that India has got the UK model of college education. That's what we inherited from the British, which is you choose your subject after school, and then you study that subject. Right? Uh, you can't really switch, and you don't study other subjects. The US model was, uh, is uh, width, and then figure out your major. And we said two things. One is people who are out of school uh, don't really know for sure what is it that they want to study. They, they, they are doing stuff on imperfect information. They're doing stuff on what is available. They're doing stuff on, yeah, I have a engineering rank in this department. So the civil engineer <coughs> is doing civil engineering because he couldn't get computer science because his rank didn't allow him. Right? So we said that there needs to be width and then depth. The second reason for width is that, look, life is multidisciplinary. So when you work or, in your, or you go anywhere else, you have to draw knowledge from many disciplines. And therefore, studying one discipline is not the best thing. Right? Uh, so for th what we said was, OK, fine. So people in India who've been to college have studied the one subject. They've done the major. So instead of doing width and then major, can they do major and then width? And that might be useful. So with that kernel of a thought, we started YF, that it'll be multidisciplinary, and people who've done the major can now look at bits. So it's an inversion of the US model. Right? And when we did that, we discovered that we were attracting a whole bunch of applicants who said, you know, I've done this, but I'm not happy. I've done this, but I think I could do with this. Right? And it was a pure experiment, and we found what was happening there was somewhat magical. Uh, you know, uh, people's perspectives were changing. People were choosing different careers than they had thought initially. Uh, people seemed to be better settled in life in their heads. Right? And we said, continue it. Now, I think the YF is staying with that basic core principle that you've done your major, you've done your depth, now do your width. And essentially, it is harvesting students from other uh, colleges where they've done one major. What is your background, sir? Uh, for, so uh, why did you join YF, and what do you think of it? So I'm also a professional sports person. So you know, I wanted to sort of explore areas of socioeconomic development, how sport can be a tool for that, and which is why I felt that you know, YF would be a good platform to start off there. And what do you think now? It's, it's, it's going OK. It's going good. I mean, it's too so, early to so, come So you know what, what YF does is it attracts a whole bunch of, uh, to, for want of a better word, and, and I don't mean it disrespectfully, a bunch of misfits. That what I was doing didn't really work that well for me. And this one helps them join the dots and put the pieces together, somehow in their own way. 
and each one in a different way. Right? And as long as YF keeps doing that and stays with that, I think we're on to the right thing. Yeah, I would say with the YF, you know, we stumbled into it. It's, um, there was this general sense. Now I think, more that I think about it, any higher ed system that's rigid, actually a YF kind of model will work. So yesterday I had some people over at home, they're coming to campus today. They're setting up the Fulbright University in Vietnam. Basically the Ashoka model. They're gonna start an undergraduate liberal arts program and they're gonna spend two nights here on campus because they want to imbibe stuff. And we were talking about the YF and they see that a YF kind of program May make, it may make a lot of sense in a place like Vietnam where, again, the same thing, it's a rigid structure. It may make sense in Africa. It may make sense, you know, in parts of the world where you have the, most of Asia, we have a very rigid higher ed model. And after class 10, students are being streamed. They haven't really read a lot. They don't have a broader perspective. So there's this potential. Will Ashoka go over there? Maybe not, but at least we can inspire many of these programs. I think there's a second opportunity. So this program will stay. I think maybe if higher ed in India completely changes, maybe there's no need for the YF. If all universities offer a broader perspective and students get it early on, but I don't see that happening in our lifetime. I think there's another, so we'll keep growing it. The, the demand is there and we feel it's a useful program. I know some alumni have felt it's becoming too large. Those who were in a batch of 57 feel that 280 is too large, next year will be 325, you know, the numbers will keep growing. But we think there's inherent demand. There's so many people applying. We think it's a good program. We should scale it. There's also an opportunity. Interestingly, there are many people who come and say, why don't you start a continuing education YF program, like a YF for seniors program? People who are 45, 50 years old, 55 years old, who have been in the same career, they studied one thing, you know, they would love to get an opening up of the mind, wider perspective. I don't know when we'll do it, but uh, we may at some point do something YF-like or experiment with it, even with the continuing ed space, because I think there is a demand, you know, for people who've been through 15, 20 years who later want to go into a program like this. So there's a lot of potential spin-offs, you know, going forward out of this program. Right. I'm sure my dad would love it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, last question. So, uh, uh, you know, both of you were saying that Ashoka should be a unique and high, highest quality uh, education institute. And obviously the best compliment you can get is someone wants to imitate and, and also the good ones imitate you. But the, there's also a new trend which is going on about the rankings, right? The ranking will sort of put you in certain boundaries and makes you to imitate the already who are best in the world. And those best in the world were there before the ranking e systems evolved. So would Ashoka like to be part of this so-called ranking race or be a, you know, away from that? Yeah, it's a very good question, Shashi. I think we've been debating it right now because of this Institutes of Excellence thing, which there's a push to get more Indian universities into the rankings because everybody's frustrated, there aren't enough in the top 200, 300. And I think we looked at it closely. In fact, out of the three rankings, I think probably QS, there, there are three major rankings across the world, doesn't push us too much away from our model. If you look at the weightages in the QS ranking, um, a lot of it is based on academic reputation which is a, just a spillover of what you're doing. But if you get put into a box around just doing certain kinds of research or just publish or perish, or looking at you know, just citation numbers, being very numbers driven, we may deviate from our core purpose. But I think some of those rankings, when you look at it, they don't pull us too far away. So if it's, I think it's a fine balance. If it's a ranking system that closely mirrors what we'd like to achieve, and it means a slight deviation, but pushes us higher up, we may make that slight deviation. But we're not gonna fundamentally move away from who we are and just try to ape the, what the, you know, just be a slave of some ranking system. Yeah, I'll just add to that. See, uh, this issue is uh, an ongoing discussion always, and it 
gets resurfaced every time there's a, there's a new ranking that are published. Right? And uh, sort of my advice to the board and is that, listen, I mean, we'll do our job and uh, we'll do our job to the best of our ability. We'll stay focused on our goals and our methods. And uh, if, uh, you know, a particular ranking system recognizes us, great. If it doesn't, uh, so be it. And we'll live with that. Uh, you see, the truth is that uh, I think uh, as long as you are in the set which is regarded as good or very good or great, right? Never mind whether you're one or you're seventh, right? You will accomplish your goals of getting the best students, of attracting the best faculty, uh, and of publishing enough good research that uh, you know you 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 will set, achieve what you set out to do. So I would not. Uh, uh, fine tune the rankings too much. This organization based on rankings. Question is, uh, what are but, but having said that, having said that, we are only founders, right? Yeah. So my question is, what are your favorite books on investment and life in general? Yeah, I think the favorite easy book to read. I mean, there's obviously Intelligent Investor and stuff like that. It's very good. But I think my favorite easy book to read is written by Peter Lynch, One Up on Wall Street. Um, it's a great book. Um, and a simpler book, which I think everybody should read, is called Learn to Earn, uh, which is a very simple 101. Because the truth is, all of you will want to do different things in life. Achieving financial freedom is a pretty important goal. And learning how to compound money however much you may have in savings, gives you freedom to do lots of other things. And just understanding the power of compounding and how to achieve that, I think is what Peter Lynch tries to uh, describe. Um, and we have a great guy, I'm trying to get him a founder, Ramesh Damani, who's a, a very good equities investor. I had him come up here, I think a year ago, and uh, we're gonna to try to get him back next year and he'll do a session, and you must attend. Because I believe whether you're studying finance, economics or not, in life, you'll hopefully have some savings. You want to know how to invest it intelligently. And even if you don't care about it a lot, frankly, it doesn't require a lot of time. There are a few intelligent things you can do in terms of asset allocation, in terms of not getting swayed by the recency effect. Very, very few simple things that will ensure that you can compound your savings much faster than everybody else. And that's what results in increasing your, your net worth over time and allowing you to do many different things without getting distracted. Okay, so we need to vacate the room by 250. Maybe one last question. Yeah. So here. <laughs> So I, I think you guys can meet uh, Ashish and Sanjeev sir after the event as well for maybe five, ten minutes, but let's take one question now. So you guys can. Yeah, I. <laughs> okay, I, go ahead. So, sir, my question to both of you is uh, during the college time, what was the um, wildest or the craziest thing that you have done? If you would like to share it with us. Wildest or craziest that I'd like to share? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think, uh, so I think uh, three weeks before uh, my third year final examinations, uh, somebody suddenly announced that, you know, there's a skiing trip, learn skiing, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, go for a week uh, to a place called Auli. Auli is now a well-known ski resort. That time it was a uh, ITBB training camp. And, uh, you know, somebody's parents or something, and there was a skiing thing happening. And I was very tempted. And I said to hell with studies. And uh, I went, and I vanished for a week. And, uh, of course, I ruined my third year, uh, which is uh, what got me a second division. I was a high first division before that, because I was confident that, you know, so the first div was a cutoff, right? If you got a first div, you were a Brahmin. And if you were not, you know, <laughs> okay, I, I was confident that I've got such high marks in my first two years that no matter what happens, I will get a first div anyway. So I went for skiing, and I learned skiing, and that's the only time in my life I've skied, actually. 
and uh, I came back and uh, sure enough, I ruined my third year and uh, I ended up with a second div. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if I should be sharing this, but anyway, I will. Um, craziest thing, I was in a fraternity in college and uh, I was rushing the fraternity. So there's a whole ritual of, you know, you have to do lots of different crazy things and I won't name all of them, but one. They took us out into rural Connecticut, so about maybe an hour and a half away from Yale, hour, hour and a half away. We had to strip down to our boxers, so nothing but, and we were left on the highway with no money. My cohort, 10 people, and uh, you know we had to literally fend for ourselves, figure out how to make it back in the middle of the night uh, to college. It was a pretty wild experience. As a token of a memorabilia for the event and a, a promotion of my own startup shamelessly, <laughs> I'd uh, like to present these to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. These, are, these are handcrafted by artisans and they were just finished this morning. No power tools have been used in these. 